Hello, welcome to another episode of Purple Insider. Matthew Collar here and joining me, Seth Kaiser, who is a Chiefs analyst for The Athletic and the writer of Chief in the North newsletter. First appearance on the show because since the introduction of Purple Insider, the Vikings have not played the Chiefs. The last time uh, was in 2019, the famed Matt Moore game. Seth, I drove all the way to Kansas City to watch Matt Moore play football, but you know what? That was a pretty memorable game for the Kansas City Chiefs. So welcome to the show, sir. I was there too. Um, that was that was one of the more fun games I've attended in part because that was like a 60-40 crowd split, maybe even 50-50. And I assume that's just because Kansas City is not a bad drive from the cities, from Minneapolis. Um, and, and, but I mean, it was almost like a college atmosphere. And that was kind of, that was just interesting. I've never attended a Chiefs game like that because normally, even with Steelers fans, it's still like 80-20 at least. I have never seen Arrowhead like that. And I'm assuming that was with Mahomes being out and it being such an easy drive. So that was fun. I remember that my brother-in-law is a huge Vikings fan. And I was sitting there. Um, when Damian Williams broke through the line and um, your safety just decided not to tackle him that day. Cause you know, that happens. It does happen. And I was sitting there like smacking him on the shoulder and jumping. He probably didn't appreciate it, but, uh, but no, I'm, I'm planning on going to this year's game. It should be fun. Folks, I've been wearing Oakley's now for a few weeks. And let me tell you, there is a reason that Justin Jefferson and a bunch of other football players wear these things because they are awesome. I've got the matte black prism sapphire polar sunglasses on, and I've been doing all sorts of summer things with them. I've been hitting golf balls in the water, jogging, playing basketball, getting sunburned, but my eyes are in good shape. I have been missing out on this experience for a long time. They are so comfortable. I can wear them all day and never get tired of having them on. Oakley is changing the game and it's time for you to discover a whole new world of possibilities with your eyewear. They are suited for everyday eyewear with frames and lenses, allowing you for to be an extension of yourself, an expression of your personality more than meets the eye. So make a sunglass upgrade now at oakley.com. Oakley offers prism lens technology, what the heck is that, you ask? Well, I'm looking through it right now. It is a proprietary technology to Oakley and available for everyday settings as well. If you want to know more, and I know you do, go to oakley.com and do your own research. And while you're at it, get yourself a pair of everyday glasses that will be sure to change your look for the better. When you wear Oakley, there really is more than meets the eye. Try it for yourself. I've worn sunglasses in the past, and I can assure you that Oakley is the best looking and best quality out there. So go on over to oakley.com for more information today. Oakley, express your style and build a look that's made for you. It should be. Yeah. And uh, it'll be Patrick Mahomes first trip to us bank stadium. And I, I think that there's no other place to begin when previewing some Vikings opponents to then to start with the greatest quarterback in the universe. And uh, you did a really great piece about how every chart that comes out, Patrick Mahomes is so far ahead of everyone else. And, and of course we know where Kirk cousins is on all those charts right dead in the middle, every single one of them. It, you're not a quarterback chart unless that happens. But something that stuck out to me of all the numbers we could talk about with Patrick Mahomes is that, so he's coming to US Bank Stadium. And I think all Vikings fans would agree, not an easy place to play. Sure. And yet Patrick Mahomes has actually better numbers on the road than he does at home which is just yeah. preposterous. And I think that home field advantage has reduced over the years with teams, with travel and all those types of things. But for a quarterback to have even better numbers away from home, I, I the only advantage that the Vikings could hold on to in facing Patrick Mahomes is sort of taken away right from the very outset. He, it is something that actually Chiefs fans have noticed as well. And, and where you end up like with some of those more absurd performances, they are usually on the road. And I'm not sure why that is. It might be, I guess, still a relatively small sample size. I mean, it's getting bigger every year. But it, they just, for one reason or another, I don't know if it's the defense plays worse on the road. And so then they just have to put up cartoonish points. But no, he is, a, he, he is very unique in that aspect. And I, I love, that's actually the second time I've written about him being, you know, the outlier and being at the top right of every chart. And then what I tell everyone is I've got a map here of everywhere that Patrick Mahomes is the best quarterback. 
Uh, that, that's what I keep in my office. <laughs> Well, and last year was kind of funny because there were times where there was a, an attempt to be like, but what if it's Burrow? And I'm like, no, it's not. It's like, I mean, yeah. we, we, there was, there was boredom with this. You and I are both old enough to remember this. There was boredom with this with Michael Jordan. It was like, but oh, yeah. what if Penny Hardaway is the net? Mm -hmm. It's like, no, probably yeah. not though. And, yeah, and I love Penny Hardaway, but like, pro probably yeah. not though. And the same yep. thing goes for Mahomes. I would love to know, though, of all the charts, what is the one that is the most telling of why this happens? Because we know what does happen, which is AFC championships and Super Bowls mm -hmm. every single year since he became a starter. But is there one that's, that sort of explains what it is that could make one person so much better at this than everybody else? You know, there's a few of them. I've actually written on him um on the way that he plays on on third and long because one thing that he's done consistently throughout his career is be significantly better it's another one of those silly you know top right charts on third and long on obvious passing downs and so i think the best charts you can look up is um and you know expected points added per play is obviously an offensive stat you know how well you're moving the ball in a way that makes you more likely to score um, I assume your your listeners know that, but I always try to throw that out there. So it's an offensive stat, but the more likely you are to be throwing the ball, you know, third and long, trailing by a bunch, the more it becomes a quarterback stat because you lose some of the advantages of, of um, you know, a good play action game, the run game. They, they've got their ears pinned back to coming after you. Mahomes, uh, in those obvious passing down situations, his efficiency raises – while everyone else's virtually it, everyone else's gets worse. Uh, I mean, like basically since the history of time, if you look at like um, their, their, his efficiency when, when trailing or on third and long, everyone else's either stays relatively the same, but only dips a little. And those are like the elite guys. Um, but his gets more. And I think that's probably the best chart. If you were to try to sum up, kind of what separates him from 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 the pack is that ability to be really aggressive but really efficient still on those obvious passing downs. So it sort of reminds me of like uh, Derek Jeter was always talked about as being very clutch. But when you look at his huge sample of postseason and regular season, his slash line is basically the same. But there's something really valuable about being the same player in the clutch right. situations and against the hardest competition. So when things get harder, somehow he was able to remain the same player. And I feel like with Mahomes, no matter how the circumstance changes around him, whether you're way down in a playoff game and he has to come back or whether it's third and long or or if you need the quarterback to run or if his ankle is broken or if there, for whatever he just is impenetrable sure. to like outside things impacting him in a league where everyone else almost is like that. Even Josh Allen is great as he is. Even Joe Burrow is great as he is. There are at least sometimes where there's impacts. And I, I guess from a skill set perspective, like you watch this so closely and you study this so closely. So, I mean, of course, all of us have seen a hundred Patrick Mahomes games by now, but you study yep. it closely. Like what, is, what does he do that allows this to happen? I mean, so just to sure. stick with the Derek Jeter example, I think it was because he was such a great contact hitter. So when you're yep. always making strong barrel contact, even against the best pitchers, you will get 33% of those that end up hits because you're always making good barrel contact no matter what. But what, what is it in his skill set that sort of allows him to overcome pretty much anything that comes his way? I think the best way would, would be to say that he's able to do low percentage things at a high, at a high rate. And what I mean by that, so when, when, I, when I watched his, his college film coming out and everyone, he was a little, he was, he was a debated prospect. There's a little, you know, retconning there, like, oh, he was so disrespected coming out. It's like, well, he still drafted the top 10 and the Saints would have grabbed him at 11. So, I mean, you know, the, people knew he was good, but the big thing you always heard about him was, was footwork, right? Being too much of an ad libber, being too risky with how he plays. And, and the way he plays is inherently risky, 
but because of his unique arm and his unique body control, he's able to play a risky way with lower risk. Him scrambling around for 10 seconds, um, it's not the same thing as other quarterbacks, even terrific ones at it, like Allen, Burrow, guys that are terrific improvisers. They are more prone to making mistakes in those situations, whereas he's able to play a high-risk form of football but still not really put the ball at risk all that often. It happens sometimes, but it's so rare that, you know, if he throws a pick doing something goofy, you're, you know, whoa, you know, it, it, whereas other guys, it's kind of, I think the, the best equivalent would be um, for, for older listeners and the older crowd when Magic Johnson entered the NBA and he was passing the ball behind his back and he was doing no look throw no look throw see no look passes and doing all these things that is just the exact opposite of how the game was played especially then and then that bred a whole group of people that tried to play like that but you can't and he could do it because of his his unique attributes and so with Mahomes i think it is that physical um you know he's got the arm and and he's got the weird bendiness he's not made out of normal human tissue apparently but I think the biggest thing for him is that it seems like, and he shares this, he has Travis Kelsey. There's an automatic cheat code built in for him. And I think he shares this trait with Kelsey where it just seems like everything moves a split second slower to him. And him and Kelsey have talked about that a little bit on, on New Heights, how he just kind of sees everything all the time. And that that's the mental aspect I think gets overlooked. You need that if you want to be able to play a high risk version of football and not pay the price as often as anyone else would. Yeah. I think there's a Steph Curry comparison there of shooting a 38 foot three pointer that still not very many people are actually doing this. I think there's maybe three guys in the league, like Trey young and uh, Damian Lillard who are doing it regularly, but it's such a high risk shot that almost nobody can pull it off with regularity. But when you can, you become unguardable because then right. people have to extend 40 feet away from the basket and everything right. sort of opens up. So as a defense, you have so many more problems and so many more things that he can create. But what I'm always amazed by is that adjustment that happened where he was throwing bombs to Tyreek Hill. And then all of a sudden there was a little pocket of time where everyone went like, oh, did he get solved? And his average depth of target, I just pulled this up uh, among starting quarterbacks with whatever number of throws, was 17th last year. Like he is just not sitting back there and throwing bombs, but he was yep. able to adapt. And I feel like the thing that gets missed because the highlight plays are so special, similarly to Steph Curry, like Steph Curry layups are usually great, like where he attacks the hoop or where he kicks to somebody open or makes an extra pass. But those things get forgotten a little bit because he's doing such amazing stuff. I, I think that the routine stuff, if Patrick yeah. Mahomes made no highlight plays, he would still be an elite quarterback just based on right read, right throw. Absolutely. I, a great comparison. I was thinking about this beforehand because I wanted to, so I, I'm obviously from Minnesota. And so my dad's been a uh, Vikings fan his whole life. Um, I've got lots of family that's Vikings fans. So I, I'm more familiar with them than I am with most teams. Um, a, a comparison I would make people, I'm, I think to this day, I bet you most Vikings fans would confirm this. People to this day don't understand how great Adrian Peterson or Randy Moss were, even though they saw all the highlights. Because what they don't understand is that every single game was like that. Everyone in the NFL has some highlights. You're, you're, they're all good enough. They're going to have some highlights. But what makes these, these really, really, really great players, I say this a lot about Jamal Charles when I talk about him because I, I, that's my lifelong goal is to get people to consider him for the Hall of Fame. But that's neither here nor there. Um, is that it's the snap by snap doing everything correctly and being constantly great not just situationally or occasionally and doing the mundane, like what you talked about. And we saw that, you know, last year teams all started playing them kind of like the Niners did a little bit in the Super Bowl, And like the Titans had some success with, um, you know, blitzing had stopped working. That's how Belichick and the Ravens and some of them were able to get them in 2018 that stopped working. So then late in 2019, they started shells in 2020. They really started working these, these, you know, as Fangio's defenses have become more and more popular with these shells and it was frustrating for him. He'd try to force it a little or he'd wait too long. He'd start to run around a little bit. His ability now to play whatever style you want to play, you know, it's supposed to be in the NFL that styles make fights. 
and he has kind of become a quarterback that whatever your defense does, he'll just he'll he'll play that style. And I mean, so yeah, last year he dinked and dunked his way to five thousand yards. It was it was crazy to watch. Yeah, and so I was thinking about uh, Brian Flores going up against Patrick Mahomes as we could kind of get into, and I and there is more great to talk hire about by it, the way uh, with the great rest hire. of the team. I'm I'm sure that there will there is times in in your writing where you're like, should I talk about other people? Um, but uh, it's never ending fascination with Mahomes. But Brian Flores is the big new wrinkle for the Vikings. Yep. Last year they're playing a Fangio system with players that didn't fit it. But right. now Flores gets to come in fresh with a lot of young players, assess what mm-hmm. they do, and he has made no bones about it, even in OTAs. He's going to be extremely aggressive and he's going to go after the quarterback. And he's kind of known for a lot of confusing looks at the line of scrimmage. Yep. But I also feel like the more you blitz Patrick Mahomes, the more trouble you potentially open up for yourself. But I think that this is actually an interesting battle because the Vikings will be long enough into the season where they'll kind of understand who they are as a defense. So Flores's schematic mind and creativity versus Andy Reid versus Patrick Mahomes um, if it's not just a boat race from the outset with Kansas City just running over the Vikings. But I, I really do think that that battle of the minds could be very interesting. Absolutely. I, I think I think Bowles was a great hire for the Vikings. I, I thought I think that uh, that the offensive system they put in place last year was terrific. Um, the the ability that they showed to continue to utilize Jefferson's skill set. Um, I thought Hawkinson was a great move. I really do. Like, I like the Vikings a lot. They're my NFC team. Like, I, I want to see them win a Super Bowl very badly. Um, just not if they're playing the Chiefs. Um, but I, I think Bowles was a great hire. He is, like you said, he's really creative with the fronts that he shows and how he utilizes them. It's an underrated aspect to ways that he he has a few times been able to give Mahomes some problems um, because he's able to present him with looks that he hasn't seen. And, and, you know, the longer a guy's in the league, the, the harder that is to do to him. But Bowles is great about mixing those things up and having individualized game plans rather than just, well, this is our system. You know, like, like Fangio gets away with that because he's so good at teaching and implementing his system. You, you can't, he's got a lot of disciples in the league now, but it's kind of like Andy Reid. You can't necessarily imitate that same thing because you're not Vic Fangio. Whereas uh, Bowles, to me, he's, he's more of a, uh, almost like a uh, um, big Lou out of Cincinnati, uh, Anna Rumo. Um, Aaron, yeah, Anna Rumo. He's he he's really good with individualized game plans and adapting to what the, his opponent likes to do. And I think that's really really that's, that makes for some terrific matchups. And then you basically you're either right or you're wrong. It's kind of like going back to Tech Mobile, you know, where you you hit a down. You either got it right and you're blowing up that play, or they're going for thirty yards. And and more often than not, Bowles is right. And so I think that was a terrific hire for the Vikings. Uh, and I think that'll be a really, really fun matchup. Because like you said, it's far enough in the season that there'll be just enough tape that both sides know a little bit what the other side wants to do. Yeah, I think that's uh, exactly right. And that matchup is not going to be easy for the Vikings with a bunch of young players. And this is where it kind of gets interesting too, because the Chiefs are still in that DeAndre Hopkins conversation. And yeah. Yet, yet there's a part of me that says, do you want to do that? I mean, of course, he's a great player, but uh, they kind of have this distributing the ball to a lot of different places thing going on. And mm-hmm. it's almost harder for defenses when Mahomes will throw it to absolutely anyone at any time and kind of can make like the way Aaron Rodgers did and Brett Favre right. before him can make stars out of guys. There's probably only five quarterbacks in the league that can actually do that. And of course he's one of the five that can actually do that. Uh, but, but I wonder about like this, this roster overall, cause it kind of was a transition year for the roster, even though they win the Super Bowl, it still was. And Juju yeah. Smith Schuster leaves. So where, yeah. where do you feel like they are with Mahomes' weapons? Sure. And so, you know, it's interesting because you're right. They are in transition there. You know, they, they, for years kind of kept things pretty static with, not just Hill, but with Sammy Watkins and Demarcus Robinson and McCole Hardman, they had kind of the same group of guys, both role players and stars. Last year, they basically completely reformed the wide receiver room around Marquez Valdez-Scantling and Juju Smith-Schuster. Um, and then even like Justin Watson is like a role player. And the idea was you're not going to replace Tyreek Hill. You can't. He's, he's unbelievable. Um, and he's unique. You know, he's not just a great receiver. He's a unique one. And so what they did instead was 
they said, okay, Juju Smith-Schuster has a good feel for zone coverages and can separate underneath. And Marquez Valdez-Scantling is, he's not a great receiver, but he's a good deep threat, a legitimate one. And so you can still threaten multiple areas of the field. And so they were able to make that work last year. This year with Juju Smith-Schuster gone, you know, Sky Moore, they took him the second round last year and then Rasheed Rice this year. Um, you're going to need to find someone to replace that role, someone who can separate against man coverage. They struggled with that at times last year because that's not MVS's game. And to an extent, it's not really Juju Smith-Schuster's game either. Um, and Travis Kelsey is who he is, but you know, you need more than one guy, especially if they're haloing the tight end, which is, it's so funny that defenses do that to Kansas city's tight end. But the thing with the, the chiefs rosters, it's currently set up with Tony rice and more is the ceiling in theory is very high. If more and rice are who they think they are. And Tony stays healthy. Cause I think everyone knows Tony's a good player. He just can't stay healthy. The ceiling is terrific. Maybe one of their better and deeper receiver rooms. The floor is scary low because you can't count on receivers developing the way you want them to, especially in Andy Reid's offense. And so that is of all the positions, it's the one, it's the one group that Chiefs fans are the most nervous about. I know I am. And you know, with Mahomes, Reed, and Kelsey, they're gonna be fine. Uh, they've got a good offensive line. They'll, they'll be good. But, you know, those individual matchups are what's scarier. If you're a Super Bowl contender, you're not just thinking about what your yearly stats look like. You're thinking about how you match up against elite defenses that like to play man coverage. So I think that's where if they are in on Hopkins, which it'll be interesting, I think it'll depend on contract stuff. I think that would be one reason why is that situational stuff just as much as anything else to to make the floor higher not necessarily the ceiling because the ceiling will always be Mahomes and Kelsey yeah I think that what you don't want is a situation where Mahomes feels like he has to force the ball to someone yep. because I do think if there was one time and th these are ultimate nick nitpicks but like there was a time where it felt like he was doing that a little bit with Tyree Kill oh, or, absolutely right and so I thought that if there was any dips that was part of it when it just, it was almost like, well, this is my guy. I've got to keep going back to him and you're right. almost better having lots of guys. But if you end up with two draft picks that don't work out and then things are a lot more difficult in an offense where you have to be on the same page with Mahomes, uh, these are definitely, um, you know, problems that everyone would want in the NFL is, you yes. know, can this receiver play with the greatest quarterback alive? Uh, <laughs> the the defense was interesting to me though, last year, because I'm curious about what the Vikings are up against there. Uh, Trent McDuffie comes in right away. I mean, they, they had a tremendous draft class, which kind of bailed them out for that transition of the roster. Yes, I mean, did. the rich, the rich got richer with that draft class. I mean, the Vikings got like 300 snaps out of theirs and the chiefs have a bunch of players already stepping right in. Um, but, but where, where do they stand right now? Because I guess I, I would say outside of Chris Jones, I'm not sure anyone scares me as pass rushers. Although of course an interior rusher could destroy the Vikings single-handedly, but that would be the area I'd say, just looking at the roster. Like I don't see anyone who's an edge rusher here. That's really all that scared. I completely agree. So last year they, they drafted Carl Loftus and to his credit, he was playable as a rookie, which anytime you say something like that, people think that you're, it's like a backhanded compliment, but it's really not for a rookie defensive lineman, unless you're taking in the top 15 ish. If you're playable as a rookie, that's great. Give us 400, 500 competent ish snaps. Um, Carl Loftus is built pretty well for spag system. You know, he likes to do a lot of stunts, a lot of twists. He likes to move guys inside and outside. Carl Loftus is good at that. Um, <clears throat> They have last year, they had Chris Jones and then a bunch of guys that were average to maybe slightly above average pass rushers. And because Jones is great and because they had a lot of bodies, they were able to make that work. Um, you know, Frank Clark played okay last year. He never really lived up to the contract, but he played okay. Carlos Dunlap played okay. Um, Mike Dana, a fifth year, a fifth round pick from a few years ago, he's actually really kind of come into his own. I think he was the second best pass rusher on the team last year, but he rushes particularly well from the interior. And so they've got they've got some guys that can be part of a complimentary pass rush, but they don't really have, they didn't at least have a solid number two guy. And I think that's what they view Charles Amenahu to be. Um, they grabbed him out of the Niners. What's interesting with him, in my opinion, is that 
he was, uh, I, I reviewed probably, I don't know, five or six games of his snaps, looking at wins, losses, and that kind of stuff. He was a really, really good pass rusher from the interior, and he was okay from the edge. He's got that length and that that get off to really help him on the interior. Really, really good strength. Um, but from the edge, he just he doesn't bend. He doesn't have bend around the corner, and he can't threaten that. It makes it tough. And so, what's interesting to me is they have multiple guys in him and Mike Dana, and then obviously Chris Jones, who are better from the interior. And you only have so many spots to rush from the interior. And their their pure edge guys right now, it consists of George Karloftis and and FAU out of Kansas State. Who you know he's a rookie. If he can be average his first year, that's a huge win. So I agree. Their lack of presence at defensive end is a huge concern because they lost multiple snaps that they haven't replaced. And so you know relying on Chris Jones to be otherworldly isn't a terrible bet because he's great. But no matter how great one pass rusher is, you have to have other guys there because otherwise you're just not going to get enough consistent pressure. And even when that one guy wins and gets pressure, if there's no pressure from anywhere else, quarterbacks can beat that. They can bail out and all that stuff. So that's that's a good that, that that's a good observation on them that right now there's question marks there, especially in terms of the edge. Yeah, and I think that that's the place if you're facing the Vikings that you want your questions because the interior is where they're so weak still, or at least that they are on paper right now. I mean, that sure. might change because they're still developing at the right guard and left guard positions. But last year, their guards allowed more pressures than anyone in the league. And I think that's part of the reason is that people know that you can't beat O'Neal and Derisaw, so you have to move around players and rush to the interior, and then you add Chris Jones to this, and it is not the greatest matchup for the Vikings. Uh, the last thing I want to ask you, Seth, is sure. so you're a Minnesotan, but you're a Kansas City follower, and sure. it's really interesting because Kansas City was Minnesota, like franchise-wise. They were always good. They had quarterbacks show up for a year or two, like Joe Montana or Steve DeBerg or – who have Elvis Gerback and have one good year. And then they would go on with their lives. Marcus Allen shows up there. Like journeyman players would have great seasons. They're in the mix year after year, after year, after year, Trent greens d- dropping dimes one year, winning 13 games. And I, I also think that Trent green is a very Kirkian sort of uh comp yeah. there. You know, I think yep. kind of a similar quarterback, but could just never get there. Now right. Mahomes is obviously the reason that they're there. What else? Like if you're saying to the Vikings, sure. if Quasi Adafamensa called you and said, Seth, you're a Minnesotan who follows the Chiefs. Tell me what it is. What should I do? How do I get from point A to point B with a franchise that's been so good for so long, but could never get to that Super Bowl level? I think something I learned going from Alex Smith to Patrick Mahomes and, and, you know, my job for it's been almost 10 years since I started doing this as a job is I the, the thing that really got my foot in the door a lot of places is charting quarterback snaps, you know, accuracy of throws, you know, whether they missed any open receivers, just kind of things that really gauge their level of play. And what I found, Alex Smith is a good quarterback and I have a tremendous amount of respect for him, like a definitively good quarterback like Kirk Cousins. Kirk Cousins is not a bad quarterback. He's a good quarterback. I think what I would say is, a good quarterback in the modern league, in today's league, is not enough to put you consistently in contention because so many other things have to go right for your team to be great. Um, I, I've actually become kind of one of those quarterback-centric people that really, I know bugs fans of teams that maybe don't have that great quarterback, but they have a good one because it's always the same things you probably hear from Viking fans are probably what you heard from Chiefs fans for years. Well, we got to fix the O-line first. I got to tell you, they went from Alex Smith to Patrick Mahomes with a slightly worse offensive line, and they were fine. They actually won a Super Bowl. And and they and so and obviously not every quarterback, you can't bring in a guy who's probably going to be Mahomes. He's on this, you know, historic upward trend. But you 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 really do need to swing until you hit there. And I would just say that that's that allows you to be in contention every year. And then if other things fall into place, then you can be in really strong contention. And so other than the quarterback, I mean, that really is, it's such a quarterback centric league, but I think having consistency and a system in place, you know, Andy Reid arrived years before Mahomes 
And I'm curious what Mahomes would have done without a team that had, because the Chiefs for a few years there had become just a laughing stock and just a complete joke. Reed comes in and starts to really turn the ship around. And that's something Alex Smith helped with. Um, and you, you establish this culture, those things that we kind of roll our eyes at now, they do matter. And you can't just go from, if you've got a coach that I think, like, I think the Vikings have that has a good system and players play hard for, that's a guy that you give repeated chances to, because that's a rare combination. You've got a lot of guys in the league that are good schematically like Josh McDaniels, but their players hate them. And that, that doesn't work for a head coach works for an OC not a head coach. And then you got some guys that are great with the raw, raw stuff, but they're just not there schematically. So I would say that the coach and quarterback thing, that really is it. And I would just say, you can appreciate everything Kurt did to help turn the Vikings more respectable, more year after year, more, you know, being consistently there. But I, I think you, you have to take some risks. And that's where I think, I think Reed and the Chiefs ultimately decided that when they said, you know what, we're good with Alex Smith, but you're only a contender if everything breaks right. Whereas with Mahomes, you're a contender unless everything breaks wrong. And that's not just true with him. That's true with basically probably your top six or seven guys in the league. So you just get as close to that as you can. And, and you know, sometimes that involves just trying and being willing to fail. Uh, you know, okay, but you took a shot. And so that's, I was hoping that Richardson wouldn't get as much pre-draft hype as he got. Cause I was hoping maybe he'd land in Minnesota, but you know, someone, you, you need a freak really at this point in the league, because especially now you're not in the AFC, which is good for the Vikings because it, to get to the Super Bowl even in the AFC, you're going to have to beat either Mahomes, Burrow or Allen somewhere along the way, probably maybe Lawrence as well. Maybe Richardson, you know, I mean, who knows Lamar Jackson, there's just all these freaks in the NFL now. And you've got to ask yourself, how great does our team have to be to be able to, sorry, I've got, I've got someone here for me. How great does your team have to be around him to even compete with these freaks? And so that's, I tell him some version of that, hopefully not in such a jumbled way. Yeah. Well, it's a great point. And uh, you know, I think that the coach quarterback relationship, and I think maybe there is a, uh, Andy Reid, Kevin O'Connell comp there with a similar approach and similarly clever offensively. So, um, yep. but I, yeah, I just, I, everything you said, I think is right on. And you think about the only quarterbacks who have pushed Mahomes to the brink, it's either Tom Brady, the goat, or yep. it's Burrow, it's Allen, it's yep. Hertz, it's playmakers, it's guys on rookie contracts, it's freaks. Yeah. Who are the only guys who can really go toe to toe with him. So, right. um, anyway, well, you do great work. I love following you on Twitter, uh, at real MN chiefs fan. It is the chief in the North newsletter. I know there's a lot of Viking and chief crossover over the years, and probably a lot of, uh, chiefs fans in the area as well that enjoyed hearing from you. So really happy to see how well your newsletter is, is done and, and everything else. So make sure you give him a follow, check it out. And, uh, we'll get together again before Vikings and chiefs, man. I, I really appreciate your time. Hey, that sounds good to me. This is awesome. I appreciate you having me. And as ever, I, I just, I have to thank you over and over on the record for, for helping me even get started in the Substack. I wouldn't have done it without your help. And, and it's been a, it's been a game changer for creating content and I'll always appreciate it. Well, your work is, uh, it speaks for itself when it comes to that. So that's why so many people have latched on. So, um, well, thanks again, man. And we will definitely get together again before Vikings Chiefs. Take care. That sounds great.